Underwriting the deal, what you don't know can really hurt you. Uh, so my goal today is to help you. Let me get control of my computer here. Sorry about that. So my goal today, well, let me tell you a little bit about my background. Brittany got into it a little bit. I'm the founder of KRI Partners and really the KRI group of companies. Um, I'm a CPA. I worked for Deloitte for seven years, mostly on the tax side. And I did all sorts of things on the tax side, the most fun of which was doing a lot of M&A and private equity work and work with a number of very large private equity firms uh, to help them get their deals done. I'm also a real estate broker in the states of Florida and Ohio. That really doesn't have any bearing other than the fact that I'm licensed and it allows us to do third party management in both of those states. I spent five years as a commercial lender with a local uh, regional bank, I should say. Uh, doing all sorts of not actually not real estate deals, but mostly uh, business lines of credit and uh, managing the business relationships of the bank. Um, we'll talk about the Cessna. Well, the, the three Cessna pilot centers we owned, uh, it was uh, a lot of fun. I'll just say that it didn't really have any bearing on our, my real estate career, but it was sure a lot of fun to learn how to fly and to uh, fly around uh, the country on, uh, on Cessnas. That was uh, a lot of fun. Got my master's of accountancy from Case Western Reserve, which is a small private school in, uh, in Cleveland area. And then I got my bachelor's from the University of Toledo. So you probably figured out I'm a numbers guy, uh, being a loan officer, a CPA. So I guess it's only fitting that I talk about underwriting, right? So my goal is, uh, you know, I kind of look at this as a two way street here. You've uh, agreed to give me some of your time and I really do appreciate that. And it's my goal to add some value to your life, to your investing, to your, uh, to your underwriting process. Um, by the way, this is gonna get a little bit long maybe. And uh, for some who uh, don't like numbers, it'll probably get a little bit boring, but if you stick around to the end, um, I'll, uh, I'll share something with you that I think uh, hopefully you'll enjoy. So, all right, how am, I gonna, how am I gonna add some value? First of all, I'm gonna show you how we underwrite deals. Now this, is, this goes beyond the back of the napkin. This is gonna do a deep dive into how we figure out exactly what the numbers should be and what they are. I'm going to share some of our underwriting tips, some mistakes that I see that I have seen people make over the years, uh, given, given that we've done third party management and our senior management teams managed over 15,000 units. So we've seen a lot, uh, especially on the, on the third party side. I've seen a lot of our clients make mistakes or about to make mistakes. And I want to share some of those with you so that you don't to do the same thing. Um, hopefully we can help you may, uh, become better at underwriting your deals. And uh, hopefully through this process, it helps you become more confident in your underwriting because I know as an owner, uh, as, a, as a sponsor and as a fund manager, uh, you need to have confidence in your underwriting. Otherwise, you're just not sure if this is the right deal for you. So uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully I achieve that goal. All right, so let's uh, talk about step one, uh, where to start. So I'm going to assume that you've already done your back of the napkin. You've already uh, read the broker's offering memorandum. I'm going to assume that you like the deal and you're ready to do a deep dive into the numbers. This analysis is not something you would do as your first step to analyze a deal, right? So this is you're getting to best and final. You really got to get the numbers right and make sure that you're ready to go so that you can get the deal. So step one. Uh, what, what I do, and we have done this, is we set up a master spreadsheet. Now, that master spreadsheet, in our case, follows our general ledger. And the reason I do that is because when I'm all done with all my underwriting, I don't want to have to do my budget all over again. I can simply hand that off to our accounting people, and our accounting people can spread that, and that becomes our budget. So the last thing you want is your underwriting to look completely different than your budget. That just doesn't make sense. So if you set it up on a master spreadsheet, it makes that process, that handover easy. Now, the other reason we do this, and this is the really important reason, and that is I see all the time people will, will look at seller's numbers, then they'll do some analysis to the seller's numbers, but the seller left things out. And sometimes it might be on purpose, sometimes it might be just that they just didn't happen to pay that expense during the time period that you looked at. So when you use my standard spreadsheet, my master spreadsheet, you're not, or a spreadsheet similar to that, you know all of the expense items that you should see, and you're going to know if something is missing, and it's not going to let you forget it when you do your underwriting. I'll show you what, the, what, what it looks like in our case here in a minute. So step two is you spread the seller's numbers. So usually it's a T12, that's a trailing 12-month statement, and I would say pay attention to the groupings, right? Because what we're trying to do here 
is to put these numbers into a into a format that you can look at and project going forward. If you don't have that standard spreadsheet and have it set up in a standard way, when you go and look at deal number two and deal number three and deal number four, the numbers are all going to look completely different because different sellers have different accounting systems. Some of them will give you something handwritten, some of them in Excel, some of them with sophisticated accounting systems. So I like to put everything into a standard format because then when I look at each deal, they're all going to look very similar. So let so now the common mistake that we make here or that I see people make here is some, believe it or not, it, it wouldn't be the first time that I'd received a seller's financial statement. And if you actually took the time to add up the numbers, they don't add up. So be careful with that. You, you, you know, you might think, okay, most sellers are going to try to hide things, but really what usually happens is they, they just did some, some uh, data manipulation and moving things around to make it make more sense. And it just screwed up their, uh, th their addition and, and so on and so forth. So it doesn't necessarily mean your seller is trying to commit fraud, but uh, I know it sounds ridiculous, but just make sure I have these numbers and make sure they add up. So let me show you what that looks like in our case. Hopefully my screen share works. How's that, Brittany? We good? All right. We're good. So this is an example of our standard spreadsheet. And uh, let me make sure I don't get ahead of myself here. Stand by. All right. So let me show you how we do this. So our, our format matches something similar to what most lenders will want to see. So we always start with gross potential rent. And when you're, well, we'll get into the details, but this is the seller's numbers in my example. Notice I said seller's analysis, actual T12. So this is what the seller reported to me. Don't worry about whether the numbers make sense. Don't worry about if numbers are missing. Just, just spread these numbers. In, in our world, we call it spreading the numbers. So you're going to drop in all the numbers as, they're, as, uh, as they fit into this schedule. And at the bottom, as you can see here, I've got utilities, I've got everything in here. I'm gonna end up with my computation of sellers in place NOI. So as you can see here, I've, I've grabbed all the various utilities that I need, cable, gas, electric, depending on where you are in the country, taxes. I've even got a place to show where taxes are gonna increase from the sale. Why? Because I don't wanna forget that taxes will probably go up. Um, payroll. Uh, you can see that we've got our different payroll positions laid out here. Um, insurance, different types of insurances. And when I talk about uh, contract services, we're talking about landscape, pest control, pool expense, whatever, whatever it is, whatever applies, you're going to want to fill in. If it doesn't apply, don't sweat it. Just leave it blank because later on we'll clean up our spreadsheet when it makes sense. All right. So let's Let's go back to step three now. So now we've got our seller number spread. That's our starting point. So now the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna analyze rents and rental income. Now, I think this is one of the most critical parts of our process. And the reason I think that is most of the time we make money in real estate because we're, we see upside in the rents. We know that they're whatever, a thousand bucks now and they could be 1200, but why do we think that? How much risk is associated with that? That's the analysis I'm going to take you through. So the first is the goal. The goal here is to understand your rents, uh, your rent upside. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to, and I'll show you this in a spreadsheet here in a second. We'll just talk conceptually for a second. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to figure out our in-place rental income. So we're going to look at a seller's rent roll and we're going to see exactly what each unit is leasing for and we're gonna figure out exactly where it is in place, the way it is today. The second thing we wanna figure out <clears throat> is something called an in-place loss to lease. Now that sounds really technical, but all it really means is, let's say the seller, somebody's lived in an apartment uh, for maybe four or five, six years, it's not uncommon at all for that person to not be paying market rent. So what we do, and I'll show you how we do this, we go through the seller's rent roll, and we will figure out what is the seller's proven market rent. So if the seller proved that we should be able to get $1,200 because he's done it a couple of times, but all the rest of the rents are at two hundred or, or at $1,000, we can feel pretty comfortable that that in-place loss to lease is 200 bucks. 
he's already proven to us that he could get 1200 and he's just still in the process of bringing the rents, other rents back up to market. And they almost always lag. Now, the reason that's important is because I assign a relatively low risk uh, on that component of the upside, right? He's already proven it, right? You don't have to go figure out if it's really going to happen. He's already showed you that it could. You just want to make sure that you've got enough data and enough evidence to support that. Yes, yeah, so definitely in my in my example, market rents are twelve hundred bucks. Now the third bucket, or the third thing we need to do, is figure out. Remember, I said most of the time we when we buy properties, we make money through the upside. Well, we have this in place loss to lease, but now we're going to go in and renovate the property, maybe, and maybe instead of twelve hundred dollars, we think that once we do our renovation we could get $1,500. So now that part of the upside is $300. I'm being exaggerating here for, for, for effect. But the point is that that part of the value that we're going to add is riskier because we haven't proven it in the market yet. I'll show you, I'll show you how we do our rent survey. So we feel very comfortable with it, but there is more risk to it than that. Now, the reason I like to go through this exercise is because if you're a sponsor, if you're an investor, or a fund manager, and you're talking to investors about deals, you're going to want to, they're going to want to understand how much risk are we taking on with our rent projections? Because in some of these growing markets, your rent uh, increases can be pretty significant, and sometimes unbelievable. And people are very skeptical about it. Well, if you're in a good market, like we, we buy in Central and Northern Florida, it is not uncommon. We just like to be able to show them how much risk is associated with these increases. So, some mistakes people make when they do this process, make sure you count units. It would not be the first time that I got a rent roll that had, if it was a hundred unit property, it had 102 units on it. I know that sounds silly, but it happens all the time. Sometimes it's the way certain accounting software packages account for pending move-ins. Sometimes they double them up on a unit. And if you're doing your data manipulation in Excel and you don't realize it, you could accidentally make the property look like it has more in-place income than it really does. I know it sounds silly, but I've seen it happen more than a few times. And then second thing that I see a lot of people struggling with and you really want to nail down is how the seller or how, yeah, how the seller's rent roll is accounting for vacant units, model units, employee units. You want to see how that is. Now, some, believe it or not, some rent rolls actually leave them off because the seller told its system it's a it's a down unit and it's not even counted in the unit count. Well, that's good to know, right? Because maybe it's not occupied now, but you certainly could. So we prefer to, to start our analysis with 100% of the property rented out, and then we will specifically uh, make reductions and deductions for some of these things that I'm talking about. But you have to spend a minute with that seller's rent roll and understand exactly what's going on and exactly how they're treating these things so that you know whether or not they're gonna apply for you going forward. So let me give you an example of what it looks like, what that looks like in our world. And I tried to keep it as clean as I could here. So remember I talked about, we're figuring out what's in place, right? Look at the, the blue section of the, uh, of the spreadsheet. That's the in place rent. So we know that the average in place rent is 1,093. So what, what I actually do is go through and count how many one ones there are how many one one R's in our world, that's, that means renovated, how many two twos, how many three twos, and so on and so forth. We figure out square footage, if it's available to us, sometimes it's not. But most importantly, we wanna know what the average rent is per unit. Then remember when I talked about that sellers in place, lost to lease. Now we're gonna do our ups, I call it the upside risk assessment is what it really is. Hopefully you can see most of this. So. The green, <clears throat> the green section of the spreadsheet, I, I, I made it green because I feel like it's pretty safe, right? It's already been proven. So in our case, we know that the seller is currently getting 873, but, oh, I'm sorry, the seller's average in place rent for that unit type is 873, but we know because we looked at his rent roll and he, we saw the most recent move-ins, several of them are actually at 882. And similarly with the, the, the one one renovated, uh, the effective in place is 971, but it's actually 999 is what we can see is the market because the seller has done that. And so we do that for each unit type and that, that allows us to conclude that our in place, whoops, sorry, our in place rents 
uh, our in place loss to lease is 1167. So what does that mean? That means almost $80,000 of annual upside is because the seller hasn't gotten all his or her rents to market rent based on what they've already proven. Now that second, the next tier is yellow, right? I did it yellow on purpose because you kind of, you got to be cautious here. So when we do our rent survey, I, I know because I did a good job on my rent survey, right? We'll pretend like I did. My, even though the seller has proven 882 for this one bedroom, it looks to me like he should be getting nine and a quarter, but he's just not. Now he's proven 882. He hasn't proven 925, but I think that's there. So I think that if I just turn that unit and did nothing to it, I should be getting nine and a quarter. That's another bucket of my upside. And this is really important because it's kind of like medium risk. Think of it as medium risk, right? The seller's proven the, the low hanging fruit, the, the 79,000 and change. I, I'm pretty sure there's another 11 there without doing anything, right? Now that's important because if you're thinking about renovating a property, what if when you got through with this analysis, the, re the market or the value that you are going to add through your renovations, right? So I think when we go in and renovate and do whatever it is we're going to do, we're going to do exterior stuff, we're going to do interior stuff. We think that one bedroom would rent all day long for $10.99 and the twos at $12.99 and the threes at $14.50. So that means that I think we can get that rent to almost $1,300 on average across the property. But that is a little more risky because I haven't proven it yet. It's based on my assessment, usually of the next tier up of property. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. Um, but there's another hundred and a quarter. So if you look at this deal, it looks like there's about 79.5 of, I call it low hanging fruit. You can get it up to 90 with, without too much stress. And if you wanna get it to 216, you wanna go in and prove that, that renovation. Now, if you did this analysis and you found an analysis where that highest risk number was only a few thousand dollars and everything else was real easy, that would impact your decision of whether or not you're gonna renovate an apartment or not, right? How much money you're gonna to spend to raise rents 20 bucks or 30 bucks, right? Not very much. So this analysis helps you understand how much upside is in place, ready to go, you just gotta go get it and how much of it you have to create. Hopefully that makes sense. Cool, Britt? All right, so let's uh, let's try to keep going. All right, so step four. Now I'm, I kind of put the cart before the horse here. So we do need you do need to do a market survey. This is critical because remember I said almost ninety five percent of the time when we make money in real estate is because of this upside. You have to know your market. You have to know exactly what's going on and how you're going to fit there. So number one, you got to be thorough. Number two, look one level up and one level down. And when I say that, what I mean by that is, let's say we've got a property that's kind of in the middle of the pack. I wanna look at the properties that aren't as nice and understand what their pricing looks like. And I wanna look at the properties that are nicer, I'm, I'm using these terms generically, uh, above it and say, okay, what does that look like? So that I can figure out, am I in the right place in the rent stack, right? You actually stack these rents on top of each other and you can see where you fit in the whole scheme, the whole neighborhood, so to speak. So the you, that's how renters, if they do their homework, they will look at your property relative to the others. And what you wanna see is you're looking for that upside, right? You're, you're looking for, if I go and renovate, can I be competitive with that one level up property, right? A little bit nicer property. Can I get there or do I need to draft off of them? What do I need to do? And it helps you make your decision. Um, I do want you to make sure you're, you're focused on critical factors, like a lot of times people ignore who pays utilities, whether there's washer dryers in, in a property or in, I'm sorry, in the units versus a laundry facility, a common facility. And sometimes people will not really appreciate the amenities. So you're going to want to understand what your property has and then what your competition has for each of these. So because all of that's going to drive how renters may look at your property, right? If your property has no swimming pool, but the guy next door does, and he has a fitness center and a clubhouse, and you have none of those things, and your units are roughly the same, well, he's going to prefer that guy's a property over yours. So you need to price accordingly. It's okay that you don't have a pool or a fitness center or a clubhouse, but you just need to be priced accordingly, right? And then that will help you understand if you're going to add some of those things, how much you might be able to get. So 
Um, I'll go through a live example of a, one way to do this. And let me, before I do that, let me just go through some of the mistakes. Brittany, are we good on time? All right, good. Um, all right, so first mistake I see people make a lot is sometimes, you know, CoStar, Yardy Matrix, uh, RealPage, Market Analytics, they all have products out there that will do a lot of this work for you. And we, we use, we've used CoStar, we've used Market Analytics, we currently use Yardy Matrix. Um, it has a lot of huge benefits in helping you understand the market. I just would ask that you please don't rely on the rents that they give you because they're late, they're behind, they're probably not right. Uh, not that they're, they're necessarily wrong, it's just they're dated, right? Yesterday's rents aren't gonna help you as to what's happening today. Second thing I see people do a lot that I, that I, I wanna caution you against is not drilling down on LRO and yield star properties. And what, I'll tell you what LRO and yield star is if you don't know. LRO is lease rent optimization, something like that. And YS is yield star. Those are two products that are owned by RealPage that they have in the market and it's the, it's the daily pricing model. So they, those systems go out, look at your property, look at your expirations, look at your inventory, look at your upcoming move, uh, move out, your notice of vacates. And it actually does what, uh, they actually look at what they know about the market and then up, increase or decrease your pricing accordingly. So when you're doing a market survey, LRO and yield start properties will make you nuts. You need to drill down and look at them because they'll literally change $100 easily within a week, even 200 bucks, depending on inventory fluctuations. So I definitely want you to drill down and I'll show you how to do that in a minute. And the last thing I see times, sometimes people don't do is they just don't put themselves in the renter's shoes. Think back to when you were looking for an apartment and imagine if you were in this neighborhood looking for an apartment, you're gonna do a similar analysis. So with that, let me try to do a, a live example here to show you, whoops, let me get to the right, there we go. So I kind of set this up a little bit in advance. I'm gonna cheat because I'm gonna use one of our own properties. This property happens to be Arbors at Garden Grove. It's located in Winter Haven, Florida. So what I do is I go to Google Maps and I type in the address and I bring up the property. So it's right there in the middle. Now, the next thing I do is I click on nearby. Now again, this is assuming you don't have other sources for this data, right? And I'm gonna type in apartments and voila it's going to show me nearby apartments right that's awesome i mean this is just google maps so i'm going to look at a couple here let's look at cypress gardens apartments first so it looks like it's pretty darn close by right it said it was four minutes away so let's click on that and let's see what happens when i go to that so on the left side it's going to bring up um, Google reviews are important to see, right? You can certainly read them and see what's going on. Very important things. But one of the things I don't see is a website, which is really interesting because that is a very large property and they don't have a website. So interesting. All right, that's good to know. So that means now that I just got to get on the phone and call that leasing office. But what did I learn from this? I learned that Clearly they're struggling because with the 2.4 uh, on Google reviews, that's important to know, right? And secondly, they don't have a website, which is really unusual because almost every apartment building on the planet has a website, if it has any size at all. So now let's go to the next one. This is another property that as it turns out is the most competitive with our, with our Arbors at Garden Grove. It is very close by. It has a 4.0 uh, rating on Google, obviously uh, well-run property. And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to their website, madisonatlakenet.com. It's gotta get through my filtering. Okay, here you go. Now there's now we're talking, because this is a beautiful website. I think that's uh, safe to say. So let me find their floor plans. And hold on a second here. Just wants me to log in. Here we go, here's our menu. All right, so let's go to floor plans because now I wanna do some real research and find out what's going on. Let's. All right, they have a one bedroom, one bath, call for details. So they probably don't have any availability. Now I happen to know this is an LRO property. We watch it very carefully. We almost watch it weekly. Um, and our goal, because, and I'll tell you why in a minute, this, our property, our goal is to draft off of them so that we keep occupancy up and make sure that we're in good shape. Uh, the Cypress, they have nothing. 
but they do have something here, the Magnolia, looks like a two bedroom, two bath apartment. Let's see what the availability is. Notice the range here on the rents. This is where people get really uh, thrown off when they try to do their rent survey. I mean, that's an absurd range. And it's because LRO, that's the limit that they put on the system to move rent. So let's look at one of these apartments, pretend like we want to rent it, and let's see what happens. Okay, so here you go. This is, this is classic LRO pricing. So the best value at this property is a 10 month at 17 and a quarter. If you want a full 12 month lease, you got to pay up and pay 2000 bucks. These are some pretty significant changes, right? Or uh, if uh, for some reason you can also get the same, oh, I see if you move in on a separate day, see interesting, you move in a day later, it's five bucks more. So see how detailed LRO pricing is. So when my a rent survey, I would use 1723 as that comparable rent. Now, as sure as I'm sitting here, next week it could be 15, it could be 21. I mean, it goes all over the map. So it, when I said LRO properties will drive you nuts when you're trying to do a rent survey, they will. Now, you'll see if you think back to my rent survey, I don't remember if this is Arbiters at Garden Grove, but I know that we're, we're asking quite a bit less. Right, so we're going to have a conversation with our manager to move our rents some because we don't we don't want to draft five hundred dollars below them. That's too much, because we're very very similar property. They just happen to have more amenities and things like that, and I know that because I will go through the property, <clears throat> excuse me, and see what they have to offer when I do that. I don't want to I don't want to mess up my uh, screen here. So. I'll see that they have a pool, they have a clubhouse, they have a fitness center, it's a very large property. They have a car wash station, dog park. So some things that we don't have at Arbors at Garden Grove. So thinking like a renter, it's gonna be hard. I'm gonna be hard pressed to be more than them. I wanna draft off of them, just not 500 bucks off of them. So hopefully uh, that makes sense. That's how we, well, that is a way to do a rent survey. The other thing I like about Google Maps is you can literally go all the way down to street level and you can drive your neighborhood. And I recommend that you do that so that you know you can drive and see what the property looks like from the front, see if it's appealing. Just watch the dates on the Google pictures because sometimes they're pretty dated. All right, so let's get back to, so now we've done our rent survey and we have a, a pretty good feel for rent where rents are. Let's go, let me go to the next screen. Okay, so now I wanna create my year zero scenario. So I'm gonna go back to my standard spreadsheet and I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. I'm gonna spread the seller's numbers and then I'm gonna spread my numbers. For the most part, I'm not gonna to have to use too many estimates. We're gonna talk about repairs and maintenance, unit turn costs and CapEx here in a minute, but we can pretty much prove out every single number in that P&L if we want to. Now, after a while, you'll get to know your area, your neighborhood, so you won't have to you know, do the deep dive and every single one of these, because you're just gonna know over time what it is. Um, and then finally, we're gonna wanna include debt service. So let me show you what that looks like in our world. So here's our year zero scenario. So these are the seller's numbers that I spread before. So now what we do, and as you can see, this looks very different in terms of format. You're gonna see it's, it's I'm gonna go through this thing line by line. And so my first number, uh, $1.26 million is, the rent roll as it sits today, if everything was at market rent, and it ties to the seller's in-place rent. It doesn't necessarily tie to the seller's T12, right? Because what they got over the 12 months is not necessarily what they're getting today. So that's our starting point. So we know that we've got, remember that 79.5 I talked about, the seller's in-place loss to lease? There it is, right? I've identified that. And then as you see, when I do the projections going forward, I'm going to I'm going to burn that off. I'm going to reduce that over time because as people either move out and we move new people in or people renew their leases, those rents are going to go up. Now, this is the part where it's critical to fit, to have the standard spreadsheet. You're always going to have vacancy loss, you're always going to have some bad debt. You may or may not have concessions. Most most properties in Florida right now are not offering any concessions uh, at all. So, <clears throat> most lenders will require a minimum of 5% of vacancy loss. If you go below that, they're not going to give you credit for it. And you might actually hurt yourself with that in the lender's eyes, because most people will at least put in 
bad debt, it depends on your neighborhood, could be 1%, could, you know, could be three quarters percent, could be 2%, whatever it is, there's no way to tell for sure. I get some evidence from the seller's numbers, if I have it, I get some evidence from the neighborhood, um, but at a minimum, you're not gonna wanna go below 1% here because it's just not realistic. In COVID, if you're looking at deals post COVID and, they st and you're getting T12 information from during the pandemic when we couldn't throw people out of their apartments for not paying, you'll see some inflated bad debt. And then you gotta dive into that and understand historically what it means and then project a reasonable number going forward. So that gets us to our net rental income. Now you notice here, the seller had employee apartments uh, there. Notice I, I took it to zero. And the reason I do that is because we don't give apartments away for free. You may, so you may want to leave a number in there that's that's important, figure out what size apartment you're going to give to them. But in our world, we, we, we have their pay is what it is. And then we, we give them a little bit of a discount if they want to live in site. But we don't necessarily encourage them to live on site because it's kind of tough to be an on site employee. They never get a break. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the other income and I'm going to look at what the seller has and I'm going to ask myself, should I be able to repeat this? So if they got $1,000 a year in admin fees, should I be able to get it? Yeah, I don't see any reason why not. Same thing with app fees. Interestingly, he got bad debt recovery. So what that is, is if they wrote off the bad debt, right? Somebody moved out, didn't pay them, they wrote it off, but then they decided to pay it, right? Because they probably went to go buy a house and they weren't allowed to because of this collection that was on their credit report. So they come back, they pay it. In your case, it has to go to zero because you don't have any bad debt that you're gonna have, have recovered yet, right? At least not in year one, maybe in year two or three, but you don't wanna leave that in there because it's gonna artificially inflate your income. And then we're gonna go through each one of these income items and figure out, are they gonna repeat for me or are they not? Or are they do require adjustment? That's all that I'm doing here. And you see a lot of zeros here, but what's important is that when I go through this analysis on the go forward, right? Not in place, but going forward, can I get more for water? Can I get more pet income? Can I get some parking income? And I will project that line item going forward, but not just not in the year zero scenario. Year zero is what's gonna happen when you when the day, the day you buy it. And it should be very similar to the analysis that the lender's doing, because you want to understand, you want to lead that lender down the path where he or she is supposed to go. And uh, they'll have their own underwriting assumptions, but you want to get as close to reality as you can. Then I'm going to go through the, the expenses. Advertising, they, you know, they said they spent 8,000 bucks. I know for a property this size, if we spend 3,600 a year, I'd be surprised. There's so many free options now. We just don't need to market in central and northern Florida for this property, it's already stabilized. Uh, common area cleaning, I, that's a number I just assume that I'm gonna have to clean the clubhouse, right? This particular property has a clubhouse, I know I'm gonna have to clean it. So maybe 600, 630, whatever you think, it's, it's a guesstimate here. Landscaping, I almost always take the seller's number, at least in the beginning. When I tour the property, if I think the landscaping looks nice and it seems reasonable that I would keep the landscaper, I don't have any reason to change that, right? Maybe going forward, I'll be able to do a better deal. But for now, I'm going to leave it in place because the seller's already shown me that he or she can get it done for that. Pest control, I'm going to do the same thing. Now, now we're getting into these individual expenses where if you haven't done this before, this is where a lot of people get lost. You know, I always get the question, Ken, I, I don't, how do I know what pest control is going to cost? Well, what I tell people to do and what I did in the beginning was I picked up the phone and I called Massey. They're all over the country their pest control company. And I said, hey, I got this 90 unit property. Here's where it's located. How much should I budget for pest control? How much should I budget for just monthly coming and doing your thing? And oh, by the way, if we get bed bugs, how much do you think that would cost? And then I call another competitor. And I, I literally do this work initially to figure out what this number should be. Now, in this particular case, I know it should be about a buck and a half a door um, because I know that little market. That's what happens there and I budgeted a couple bed bug cases a year. We don't, bed bugs are far fewer than they used to be, but I think it would be uh, um, not a good idea to not budget it, right? Now we have pool expense. Notice the seller didn't have any pool expense. Okay, so why is that? There's a pool there, what's going on? Okay, well, how do I figure out how I'm gonna treat the pool? I can't just take that seller's number and just run with it. That would be not a good idea. Because I, I don't know, I don't even know what that, five, maybe that 500 is just chemicals. Maybe they have a certified pool operator on staff and maybe we will or will not going forward. But 
I know the 5,400 is the right number. And I know that because I called the local pool company and I said, hey, at this particular property, we use Mannix pools. I say, hey, Mr. Mannix, how much are you going to charge me to take care of my pool? You're going to come three days a week. You're going to clean it. You're going to do the chemicals and blah, blah, blah. What's it going to cost? He gives me the number. That becomes my budget number. Now, this is a lot of work. You don't have to do this on every deal. But once you understand what the costs are, you, then you know. Now, this is how you build confidence so that when you get to your number, you, you know. I know this number is right. Why? Because I did the homework to make sure that it was right. And this is the number one mistake that people make is not taking the time to do this. Resident screening. We know we're going to have to screen our residents. Trash removal. I usually pick up from the seller because he's, pull, he's removing the trash now. It seems reasonable. That's going to cost me similar. I might be able to get it down. We'll see. But for now, I'm going to budget it the same as seller. Property insurance. Um, in most, I would say everybody should have an insurance broker that they can call and just say, hey, what do you think it should cost me here? I think I use 550 as an estimate here, but generally before I am ready to submit an LOI, I will call our broker and say, hey, here's the address. Here's what kind of property it is. I'll send him the offering memorandum and he'll give me a rough idea what it's going to cost. And then if it's in a flood zone, you're going to need a number there. Notice, would you necessarily even remember to ask about flood insurance? You might not, but because we're using a standard spreadsheet, it's a reminder. Oh, wait a minute. Do we have a, do we have flood insurance here? No, we don't, right? Because you wouldn't want that to be uh, missed. That would be uh, a mess, especially because it's required when it when it, you're in a certain flood zone. All right, property management fees. Um, you know, you just want to do competitive. I think 4% is probably the number there. Miscellaneous expense is sort of what I call my cushion. Um, it it, uh, it It's just there because I'm probably going to miss a number and I want to have something in there to, to give me some room. All right, payroll. We know we're going to pay a leasing person and a maintenance person at this size property is going to be one person in, one person out. So that means one person in the office, one person out in maintenance for 100 units. That's a good starting point. And the way to figure this number out is based on your, your local community. It's, it's your, your local market. Labor is really hard right now to get. No question about that. I used to be able to budget this at 17 an hour. I can't now. I use 21 an hour now for my budget. I mean, that's a crazy increase, but that's what's really going on on the ground. So I'll take 21 an hour times 2,080 hours because that's a full-time person and that's what it's going to cost me. That's their compensation. And then I'll make accommodations for health insurance benefits. Now we happen to have a robust benefit package that I need to account for, but maybe you don't. Maybe you don't offer your employees insurance. Maybe you just have to pay them more. I don't know. But however you're going to run the property, you want to budget this out that way. Payroll I th expenses, uh, um, taxes expense, I usually use around uh, 15 to 20%. 15 here is fine. Um, I've got some workers comp. Uh, I think I use 1% for that. That's reasonable. And uh, HR processing, you're, you're going to have to have someone process your payroll. Almost no one does payroll processing in-house now. And even if you did, you'd still have expenses associated with it. I'm going to skip over repairs and maintenance and sweet turn costs just for a minute. Um, I'll come back to it and I'll tell you why. Um, supplies, we know we just, we're going to need some stuff, right? We're going to have shovels and rakes here and there to buy, things like that. So I just throw a number in there. It could be 1,000. It could be 1,500. There's no magic to that number. Taxes and licenses, we know that most jurisdictions have either an occupancy permit or some sort of business license. So we know we're going to have to buy it. Maybe in your jurisdiction, it's 150, who, who knows? Whatever it is, it is, you're gonna to wanna to account for it. It's not enough to make really a, a huge difference, but at least you're complete. Now the taxes, most of the time, uh, so what you see here is I mirrored the seller's number and then you, in Florida, it's, it's, there is no question the taxes will go up with the sale. In Florida, here's the formula and you just have to figure out your formula for your era, for your area. Some people just use a, you know, 1.8%, 2%, you can do that. But I prefer to, to, sh to show people that I really know how taxes are calculated. So in Florida, I'm going to take the sale price times 80 or 85%. Then I'm going to multiply it times the millage rate. Then I'm going to take a 4% discount because I'm going to pay as early as I can and they'll give me a discount. And then I'm going to add my non ad valorem taxes. Those are taxes that are not related to value. Add that and that's going to be my number. Right, so you want to show that taxes are going to go up or down or whatever. I, I doubt if they'll go down with a sale. I, I don't think I've ever seen that happen. You'd probably have to fight for that. But if it's possible to go up, they will likely go up, and you want to account for it. 
Don't let a broker send you a, an offering memorandum without an adjustment to taxes and just assume that they know what they're doing because they don't. Most of the time they leave that to you um, in, many, in many cases. So utilities, I know. So you, you see here, the seller's got some numbers. I know between cable, internet, and phone, we're gonna spend about 200 a month. So I split it 1200 each. Uh, so it's 2,400 bucks between the two of them. If I'm paying, if the seller's paying $1,500 for common electric, I see no reason to change that at this point, right? You're it, just adopt their number. Um, their, their vacant units, they had 4,000. I think that's a little high. I mean, that in Florida, you need to have the air conditioner on even when it's vacant. Otherwise the whole apartment fills with mold and that's obviously not a good thing. In your jurisdiction or in your market, it may be mild enough that you don't need to do that. You may have very low uh, vacant electric, but I like to break it out because it's a number that we like to manage, right? We don't want maintenance guys leaving the air conditioning down to 65 all night when they're not even in the apartment, right? We don't want it ever at 65, but they do it. And when this number creeps up, then I'm able to see it. So that's how I handle that. Uh, water sewer, I typically adopt the seller's number for now. Now there's lots and lots of ways to save money on water sewer. There's no question about it, but I don't know that you wanna necessarily bake that into your year zero analysis. I would do that in a projection, right? Cause you're gonna spend the money to make that happen. And if it's gonna happen, you should get the benefit of it. So keep it in the where it is right now. Uh, just know that you're going to have some room later. The next section here is just all administrative expenses. They're very insignificant. But what I try to do is just remind myself that don't forget, we're going to have to pay. We use Blue Moon leases. We're going to have to join NAA. That's what it's going to cost us. We got to pay train our employees because you do. You know, these are all costs that people will forget about if they're not careful. We're going to have to prepare a tax return. We're budgeting 2,500 for that, especially if you're doing a syndication or a fund. I mean, those couple those tax returns get uh, complicated and you can't do them in house. You just can't. You're going to have to have some budget number here for evictions. These are estimates. You know, it could be a thousand. I know in Florida, it's roughly $500 to evict someone. We don't evict very many people because we're usually able to work with them to leave. So I just assume we're going to have two evictions a year. And uh, that's how we've accounted for that. Software expense, this used to be a fairly low number. It's not anymore. I mean, technology has really found its way into the real estate world. In our world, it's about plus or minus three bucks a, a door. So that's what I use for budget purposes. And our website, uh, we noticed, remember that Cypress uh, Gardens place didn't have a website, which is crazy because for a whopping 50 bucks a month, they could have had a beautiful website, pretty similar to the one that Madison at Lake Ned. But you want to account for it because you're going to have to do it. So let's talk about reserves here. Um, I, I want to share a little trick here. I'm, a, I'm an accountant and I know that if you buy a garbage disposal, I can argue that it is a repair and maintenance cost, right? Because you do them all the time and they break constantly. Or I could argue that I I'm going to probably change it every time we turn a unit, right? So I can make the argument that it might be a sweet turn cost. Or I could say, wait a minute, that garbage disposal benefits several years. That's really a capital expenditure, right? Well, I get rid of all of that argument by adding them all together, looking at the total. I don't care where these different expenses are allocated now, whether they're capital, whether they're repairs and maintenance. What matters is that I have a normalized number going forward. Now, remember, I said you can prove out every number in your P&L. These are the ones you can't because I don't know what's going to break tomorrow. I don't know exactly how many units I'm gonna turn next year. I just don't, there's no way for me to know it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make some assumptions about long run numbers here. And I always tell people start at 750, that's assuming the property is in great shape and, it's, and it does not include any improvements to your units or things like that. That's normal repair, you know, replacing appliances and, and carpet if you have it and things like that. And based on the condition of the property, you're gonna to wanna to go up. I'd much rather see you close to a, closer to a thousand a door. That gives you more comfort, uh, but you can certainly start at 750 or 800. If you're between 750 and a thousand, I think you're probably gonna be okay. Most lenders will probably be in the 850 to 900 range for a 20 or 30 year old asset. So that is how, and I know this has been a long trip down through this P&L, but this is, a really, this is the nuts and bolts of how we figure it out what we end up with is NOI. And what's important is that you have enough NOI, net operating income, to service your debt. 
because the lender is definitely going to look at that and make sure that you have enough money left over to service the debt and your investors are going to want to know that you have enough money to not only service the debt, but pay them too, right? So that's what we're trying to accomplish here. I didn't go through all that here because I felt like I've tortured you probably enough, but at least it gives you a good feel for how detail oriented you can be and should be when you do your underwriting on your deals. It gets much less painful after you've done this a few times. I really want you to do it in the beginning. If you're new to this business and haven't done it before, it is the only way that you will get confident in your numbers and have a clue as to whether or not you can afford to buy that property or not. So let me, uh, I think we're just about done here. So, um, all right. So now I've created my year zero scenario. That should give me some clue about what I should pay. Uh, the year zero mistakes, I think I talked about some of these. I see a lot of people try to ignore payroll with small properties. They will try to bump up management fee expense instead of that. Please don't do that. Every, every, but every property is going to need someone to go there and unclog the sink and everything else. And you don't want to use outside contractors for all of it. You'll go bankrupt. Second mistake, not adjusting taxes. Make sure you handle taxes. Guesstimating insurance. Please don't do that because the insurance market is very squirrely right now. And you just want to understand what it's really going to be. Don't underestimate vacancy. Don't try to underwrite a 2% vacancy. It's not going to happen. In fact, it's almost impossible to get better than that if you just do the math on, on a two-week turn time on a unit. Um, I see people, the big mistake they make is that they'll, they don't want to do their homework. They'll rely solely on their property management company to estimate expenses. Please don't do that because now you've, put, you've taken a leap of faith that they've taken the time to do this homework. And I think that's a big mistake. Don't do that. You should know your numbers yourself and have your property management company sign off on them. I'm all for that. And we do that with our clients all the time, but to have them do your underwriting for you, first of all, it's just too laborious. They won't have the time because they're probably doing it for lots of people if, if they're doing it for you. And you want to know yourself what those numbers are. So when you look at an investor, you can say with conviction, these numbers are good because you did them yourself. Um, projecting all the rent increases in year one. I've seen people do this, sounds silly, but I've seen people in year one take rents from 800 to 1400. And uh, yeah, maybe they'll get there, but it's gonna take some time because you don't turn the whole property in one year. That's just not how it works. Um, I always see a lot of people, let's see here. I see we're almost out of time. So I'm, I'm working hard, Brittany, to get done, I promise. Um, I see a lot of people will go through this analysis and then they don't like the result. They're like, oh man, this is not cool. So they go back and they start playing with the numbers and they start playing with the numbers. Aha, now I got it to work. Be careful doing that, right? You may have legitimately over conservatively uh, estimated a number, but don't fall into that trap where you're, you're, you're pushing that deal down to make it work, right? Because someone said to you, well, the property next door sold for 110 a door and 113 a door. It should, it should make sense that this one should sell at 110 a door. What the property so far next door has absolutely nothing to do with what you should pay for it, right? These properties are valued based on their ability to generate income, cash flow. That's the way they're valued. And that's the way I want you to value yours so that you don't get yourself in trouble. So you don't find yourself with debt so big. And, and quite honestly, the banks won't let you do it. Um, now, back in 08 and 09, they did let you do it. That's part of the reason we had the big crash. But now they're holding really firm on these things and not making those mistakes and not letting people do that. And their position is, you want to overpay for a property, that's fine. We're only going to lend this much. You can pay for as much as you want, but the rest of it's coming out of your debt pocket and not theirs. So that's a really good thing for the health of the, uh, of the business. Um, last thing, not understanding a lender's perspective. I spent five years as a lender and uh, you know now I'm on the other side of the table and lenders aggravate all of us to no end. They, they drive everybody nuts because they want this piece of paper and that piece of paper and show me this and show me that. W what you need to understand is lenders have to put a file together that they're, they're gonna send to someone for approval and they have to have a complete package. It might be Fannie, it might be Freddie, it might be internal depending on the lender, might have a loan committee. Um, I don't know if they actually exist anymore, but back in the day they did. They need all of these things because after the loan is all done and you're off on your happy way, some regulator is going to come through and open that file and look at it. And if a bunch of this stuff is missing because they didn't get it from you, they're going to have a serious problem. Or they may not be able to securitize that loan. They may not 
be able to take that loan and securitize it, put it together with other, other loans, similar quality and go sell it off, right? So just know that when lenders drive you nuts, they don't really want to drive you nuts. Now, the real aggravating part is when one branch will ask you for one thing and the other branch will ask you for the same thing. Just forward the same email and don't worry about it, all right? So be kind to your lender because in the end, they're going to help you get your deal done. All right, step six, and I'm not going to spend much time on this, but we're going to create our year one through five projections. And because it gets messy, right? I can't really demonstrate this on this on this call because I can't do a screen share that'll make it look nice. But you're going to project your rent increases. Generally, you're going to turn 35 to 45 percent of your property every year. Build that into your rent increases. So we're a fan of when we do renovations, when we do big rent increases, do them when the property turns organically. I mean, how much faster do you have to turn this thing, right? You don't want to start running people out with $400 rent increases. Um, because then, then you could have some problems, right? Uh, you'll, they'll start calling the city and everything else. Um, try to project new revenue sources. You might have them, right? You might be able to get parking. You might be able to do better on the water recovery, valet trash. There's all sorts of things that you could do. Build those into your projections and build them coming into, uh, you know, coming into your PL maybe over a year or two, right? Don't think they're going to hit year one all 100% because they're not because your leases have to turn in order to make this happen. Um, consider timing of certain events. I talked about this. Think about when the taxes are going to increase. Know when your lien date is, right? If your lien date's 1-1 and you bought it on January 10th, guess what? You might have an extra year before that tax increase actually hits your numbers. Know that kind of stuff about your market because then that allows you to better project going forward. Mistakes people make, they're too aggressive sometimes. They're, they're too aggressive on their expense reduction, too aggressive on their rent increases. But you're gonna, when you do this level of homework, you're not gonna be too aggressive because you're gonna know it and it's gonna make sense. And you're gonna be very, it's gonna be very supportable. So when you look at an investor and have a Zoom call with an investor, you can tell them with conviction, you know what these numbers are because you called the pest control company, you called the pool company, you know what's going on. And they can feel confident knowing that you did that level of homework. Um, finally, I talked about this before, changing the deal to the pencil, to the deal pencils out. Please don't, just don't do that. Um, everybody falls into that trap and you just got to remember to stop yourself. Um, step seven, create an exit scenario and return metrics. Um, let's see, we're running out of time here, so I'm not going to spend much time on this. Uh, what you want to do is take the deal all the way to exit. Figure out what it's, what it's going to look like when it when it exits. Figure out what NOI is going to be in year five, if that's your planned hold period, or year seven, or year three, whatever it is. Apply a reasonable terminal cap rate. A terminal cap rate is, is the cap rate that you expect to be there when you sell it. So, you know, if you're buying it at a five cap, don't, don't do your exit cap rate at a four or three cap, right, to make it look like you're going to uh, it's going to be more, uh, you're going to make more money. Use a reasonable cap rate and project it out and then calculate your returns. The returns you want to calculate for your investors, annual rate of return. They always want to know what your cash on cash is, uh, IRR and equity multiple. Uh, Veravest uh, tends to focus on the IRR. That's an important metric and I love it. And it's because it takes the time value of money into account and it helps, helps you compare different cash flows occurring at different times with from different sponsors, it'll help you understand at least you, you have one metric that makes sense that puts all of that stuff into uh, into one, uh, one metric. Uh, mistakes, not being realistic about selling expenses, not using a criminal cap, terminal cap rate that is, uh, that is reasonable. I think I just talked about that. And oh, and not including all fees in your exit scenario, right? If you're a syndicator, if you're a fund sponsor, you have a carry interest at the end. You may or may not have fees. Bake those into your exit scenario so that you know how much money your investors are really going to make. And then if you've done your work correctly, you're going to put a, a P&L together or a projection together that is very reasonable. And it's going to put you in a position where you're going to under promise and over deliver, which is always what you want to do. You don't ever want to be in an opposite situation with investors, right? Because that's very difficult to explain and not fun conversations. So if you're projecting 12% or 14%, you know, be conservative so that you can beat it. When you when you do the deal and you're done, you end up with 20, 25, 30%. Those are much more fun conversations to have than the other. So wrapping up, all right. Um, I, I know this is not an opportunity uh, webinar. I just wanted to remind everyone, this is our last call for our uh, multifamily real estate fund. We're wrapping it up now. 
If you have any questions, feel free uh, to, to ask me. Um, I told you I'd give you something at the end. If anybody's interested, um, this is really a book for passive investors. KRIpartners.com slash ebook. Um, I wrote a book. It's multifamily real estate. It's a total game changer. It focuses on two things. The first is helping you figure out how you're going to get your share of all this money that you know people are making in real estate. Helps you figure out, should you be an active investor? Should you buy a duplex? Should you buy an apartment building? I think most people in the end will figure out that they should be passive investors, which is part of the reason Veravest is here. I mean, I think the services they provide this industry is tremendous. I mean, I, I couldn't be more thrilled that we have the opportunity now to be vetted and to show you our transparency. I think that's critical and that's critical to the long-term health. So having said that, the second part of my book talks about how to vet sponsors. Sort of some behind the scenes, this is what makes sponsors tick. This is the kind of things you wanna look for. This is what in, you know investor-friendly terms look like and some questions that you might wanna ask a potential investor. So go to kripartners.com slash ebook, download that ebook. You do have to give us your name and email. That's, that's, that's our exchange, if you don't mind. And then you download the ebook and then you're on our list. If you don't want to stay on our list, just unsubscribe. No, no worries. Um, if you want to reach me, you can email me at kgee at kripartners.com or call me at 813-489-9666. And Brittany, you'll have to tell me if we have any questions. Yes. Yeah, so we do have a few questions, Ken, if we can have your time for a second. Sure. So we have one question that says, when estimating payroll expenses and you plan, you plan on using a management company, do you ask the company to provide the breakdown of their costs and input it in the spreadsheet? Or would a total cost single line suffice for the lender to see in the calculation? Yeah. So you can give a one line uh, to the lender in your, in your P and L that are certainly nothing wrong with that. What I care more about is that, you know, what's behind that number. So we have, what I didn't show you is we have a, a spreadsheet that actually goes and calculates payroll. It, it says, uh, leasing or property manager, $21 an hour, 2,080 hours. This is how much they're going to cost maintenance person. Then it adds in all of those other costs. As long as you know, what's behind that number, I'm totally cool with it. Um, you can ask your, your uh, property management company what they think. Property management companies shouldn't be marking payroll up. They should be passing it through as a cost, assuming you're not doing a one to four family property. Those are very different. But assuming it's an apartment building, it, there's nothing wrong with having them look at your payroll. Remember I said having them so, sign off, so to speak. I mean, it's, it will take them 30 seconds tops to estimate your payroll if they know where it is and uh, what size property it is. One last thing I'll say about payroll, be careful about managing payroll down. Number one, the labor market is crazy, crazy tight right now. And number two, in 23 years I've been doing this, I have never ever once been sorry I overpaid someone on site, but I can tell you repeatedly, I have been sorry for underpaying someone, okay? So just be careful about managing that number down. Good question, hopefully that helped. Okay, Ken, and there's there's been a plethora of people asking about your spreadsheet. Um, they would like to get a copy of the presentation. One, yes, you will be get, able to get a copy. And then two, is your spreadsheet available or downloadable in your site for them to practice? Yeah, it's, it's currently not, um, but um, I will do my best. It, it's really an internal spreadsheet and it was done by an accountant, so it's not very user-friendly. Brittany saw a previous version of it and she will tell you it's not very user friendly. So I, I'm so what, I, what it would probably make sense is I can, you know, I'm happy to jump on the phone with somebody if they want some help with their underwriting. Um, I will tell you there's a couple of commercially available programs out there that probably do a better job of accounting for everything because, you know, this, again, I, I've lived on spreadsheets. So there's, I know what I have to adjust and what I don't. And it's not really something I can pass out to everyone and have it work perfectly for you. And I would feel horrible if there was an error in a cell somewhere because I didn't have the right quality control and you, and you made a mistake and it, and it cost you some problems. But uh, I think there's one out there called the cash flow analyzer that you might want to buy. I've seen it. I think it's pretty good. Um, there's another one. I think Michael Blank may have one as well. 
I could be wrong, but I think he does. I think you're um, correct, yeah. Is that right? So there may be a couple of others out there. They kind of accomplish the same thing. Now, most of the time they won't go into the level of detail that I will. What I am happy to do is to send you that spreadsheet that shows you all of the various expense items. I'm happy to email that to you because that won't get you into trouble. I just, my inter, my spreadsheet is literally 10 worksheets deep and it's all interconnected and you have to know what needs to get changed and what doesn't. And it, it would require a whole training course to get through that. So yeah, I'm happy to do that. You just gotta, uh, Brittany can send me the emails. I'll be happy to send it out to whoever wants that. Yes, absolutely. Maybe right in the chat if you guys are interested and we'll send it your way. Um, we have time for maybe a few more questions. Um, what is RUBS and how does it apply here? Yeah, good question. RUBS, RUBS is Ratio Utility Billing System. So it is a system uh, that is generally acceptable um, to bill back utilities to residents. Now, almost every municipality has a different set of rules that you have to follow. And the rules are generally centered around a concept that in order to be a utility company and sell utility services, you have to have a special license and all kind of, do all kinds of things, right? So in order to avoid that, number one, you, you generally, this is generally, right? You gotta check on your municipality, but generally you can't bill out, if you're gonna bill out water, you can't bill out more than 100% of your water. You can't make money on utilities, that you can't do that. However, most, um, most jurisdictions will allow you to um, calculate. So, so let, here's how we generally do it. We have one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedrooms. That's gonna be half of the math. So if you're in a one bedroom and you're one person in a one bedroom, we'll look at the number of occupants and the number of bedrooms. And we'll use that data to then figure out what's your pro rata share of the total water bill for the property. That's what's actually happening. So they take the total water bill they subtract what's, what you tell them to be a common area deduction. If you have no pool, well, you're probably going to have a very, very small common area deduction. But if you have a pool, two pools, a sauna, a hot tub, well, guess what? Your, your, your common area deduction might be 5%, might be 10%, whatever is appropriate. That's an estimate. Then you're going to bill out the rest of it. And, you, and uh, usually you have to use a third party a company to do it for you so that it's objective. And most jurisdictions will allow you to charge a service fee to cover the administrative cost of doing that. Now, I'm a huge fan of rubs. And it's interesting because early on in my career, and one of the things you saw in my spreadsheet was a UCRS, right? It was back when the gas prices in Cleveland, Ohio were completely out of control. And I had to figure out a way to recover it. So the fastest way I did it was a utility cost recovery surcharge. And I picked a flat fee. Well, I used to love flat fees because it was easy. You just put it in your system and it's a no brainer. Except what I learned over time, and this is a, you have to really dive into this business to think it like this, but people, when you ask them, how much is the rent? You tell them it's 800 and $40 for water. Okay. In their mind, they immediately say the rent's for 840. That's just what they do. Cause you gave them a flat number. Now I love, and we don't even know if that flat rate number with all the apartments filled will always match your uh, water bill because sometimes water's higher, sometimes it's lower. So I like the rub system because I can control how much I don't recover. And in most of our cases, we recover 90 to 95% of the water bill. So as our total water bill goes up, that means the people on the property use more water. That means everybody pays more. And when a prospect comes in and you tell them the rent's 800, oh, by the way, yeah, you have to pay your own water. How much is that? Well, it depends because it's a rub system, it's allocated. Oh, okay. And they leave thinking the rent's 800, because it is. They don't automatically add that $40 flat fee on top, which starts to make you uncompetitive if you're in a, in a competitive market. So hopefully that answers the question. Yes, and um, lastly, we got lots of emails for people who want your spreadsheet, Ken. Awesome. So great thorough job there. And then the last question is, I'm a newbie to real estate. How do you differentiate your underwriting model from others? How do I differentiate my underwriting model from others? So it, my model is based on, it, I, I look at the accounting world, we call it a bottom-up budgeting process. So 
a lot, if some of you have gone to the seminars and, the, and they'll give you workbooks that say, you know, contract services should be $250 per unit and this should be $400 a unit and management fees should be, the, you know, those are all averages, right? I don't ever want you to use those. You can use those for your back of the napkin analysis, but please don't use it beyond that because I can stack three properties next to each other pretty much in the same neighborhood and get three completely different results. One of them I make a killing on and one of them I get destroyed on. So don't do that. My, my model is based on the theory of reality. I mean, it's bottom up, um, it's bottom up budgeting. Remember I said, I called the pest control company. I don't call them anymore because I know the answer to the question. But in the beginning, you said you were a newbie. I called them because I wanted to know and I didn't want to guess and I didn't, I, I just, it's too dangerous. I, I thought it was too dangerous because eventually you're going to do this and you're going to invite partners into your deal and partners get really uncomfortable if they don't think you've done that level of homework, right? I mean, you're asking them to give you a whole lot of money to invest with you, but you don't know how much pest control is and how much the landscaping should be and how much you got to do that level of homework. So it's the bottom up approach. Um, I feel very strongly that especially for new people, you got to do it. You got to do it because number one thing that kills people in this business and makes them not buy their first deal is that they're scared because they're not sure. Well, you can nail down almost this whole thing. You can't be much more sure than that, right? You go through and you do the work, then you're going to feel confident about it, right? I always say knowledge builds confidence, right? I know what pest control is because I know, because I look at the bills, because I called them. I know what the pool is going to cost. I can't get you any more confident than that. All right, if that's it, you guys, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Ken, for being the guest speaker. We appreciate your fountain of knowledge that you supplied us with this afternoon or evening if you are in ET time like Ken. Yes, I am. Uh, thank you guys so, so much for joining us. Yes, thanks so much, Brittany and Veravest for doing this. I really enjoyed it. And hopefully, hopefully I saved someone some money here tonight. All right, take care, All right. everyone. Thanks, guys.